So I am very excited that David Cantor can join us today to give the data seminar. Um, I, I heard uh, about his talk at ModSim and was told we absolutely must get him here. So um, I uh, would like to introduce David. Um, he is the founder and the executive director for ML Commons, uh, where he helps to lead the ML Perf benchmark and other um, initiatives. He has over 16 years of experience in semiconductors, computing and machine learning, and has a, a lot of opinions is what I've been learning, <laughs> which is great. Good, good opinions, good and with, with founded, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, reasons as well. Um, he founded a microprocessor and compiler startup, um, was an early employee of Astro Data Systems, and has uh, been consulting industry leaders such as Intel, NVIDIA, KLA, Applied Materials, Qualcomm, Microsoft, many others. Um, so David comes to us with, with a bachelor's degree um, with honors in mathematics and specialization in CS, uh, a bachelor of arts in econ uh, from the University of Chicago. And we're really excited to hear about the challenges and directions in ML system performance and the ML perf story. So with that, David, it's all yours. Thank you. I also point out that I'm flattered to be invited by, by Berkeley, although I'm perhaps a little bit disappointed that I wasn't invited by Argonne, since they're affiliated with my uh, alumni institution. I'll have to, have to talk to someone about that. <laughs> um, so uh, yes, I do have a lot of opinions. Uh, on, I'll have to be a little bit circumspect with those in a recorded environment, but I, I hope it'll be a fun talk nonetheless. So, uh, you know, this talk is really, kind of an overview of some of the unique challenges in ML benchmarking and how the ML Perf community has approached it. Uh, since we are kind of focused on sort of more scientific computing and HPC, I, I'm, I'm going to focus a lot on training and we might talk about inference if I have time at the end. Uh, the last time I gave this talk, I did not. So I don't want to get your hopes up too high. <laughs> but, uh, you know, thank you for the fantastic introduction. Uh, so I want to first start by talking about ML Commons, which is the organization that runs uh, ML Perf. We are an open engineering organization that kind of focuses on the intersection of engineering and AI. So if you think about a lot of AI organizations, a lot of them do policy work and don't really build things per se. Um, and then a lot of collective engineering organizations like IEEE or 3GPP just don't really focus on AI or ML. And so it's sort of at the uh, overlap of the Venn diagram, as you see here, is sort of what we think of as the ML common sweet spot. So that's kind of shapes our view of the world. Um, so these are some of the folks who are involved. Um, you know, we've got uh, uh, our founders are drawn from academia and industry, we've got over 100 members, if you include individuals, and I think we're closing in on about 50 corporate members uh, and from you know all different continents. We're, we're representing six of the seven different continents. And so if there's anyone from McMurdo Station, or if you know people on McMurdo Station, please send them my way because it would be my honor to say seven out of seven continents, that'd be pretty cool. Um, so, uh, you know, we do have an academic heritage uh, along with sort of industry work, and we do really see both of these folk, uh, both of these communities as being uh, vital constituencies. Um, so our mission is building better ML for everyone. And we really look at that, accomplishing that through sort of three key pillars. Uh, one is the benchmarks that's ML Perf today. Uh, there are other things that we have you know, maybe on the roadmap or in gestation at, at the moment. Oh man, I'm getting pretty washed out. Uh, oh well. Uh, and uh, then building large public data sets. So, you know, if you look at uh, ML to a large extent, you know, what has kicked off this latest revolution was the, the, the recognition that neural net, deep neural networks could beat humans at image recognition on ImageNet. And so, you know, you can trace it back to ImageNet and say it's all, you know, thanks to that. And so, you know, when I look at what do we want to do to help the industry grow, part of what I say is we want to do ImageNet for other things, whether it's speech or, you know, MRIs or, or, or whatever, but ImageNet for blank, you know, is one way to think about that as a way of unlocking forward progress and really helping the industry uh, uh, move forward and magnify the impact that, that ML can have on the world in a good way. 
Uh, and then the last is sort of best practices, which this is a little bit ambiguous, but I think of this as being focused on ways that we can reduce friction in machine learning. The, the, the chief best practice, I don't know if I have a slide on this later, but you know, whatever, uh, is one called ML cube, which is really how do we take containerization and take it the next level up so that it really is truly black box and you can just kind of get an ML model, pass it to someone, not worry about their infrastructure and then fire it off and programmatically manipulate it by just saying, go train, right? So that, you know, if you run an experiment, say at NERSC or Lawrence Berkeley, you know, you can pass it off to your peers at uh, ORNL and say, hey, here, go run this. And instead of spending months wrangling because your hardware is a little bit different, or, you know, you put the data in the wrong directory or, or whatever, you know, it just works and gets going, right? So, you know, things like that help make ML more uh, usable to the entire community. And then we do have a research group where we're always working on new ideas. And, you know, some of them eventually bubble up to be full on working groups. So, you know, ML Perf HPC, which, you know, Steve has played a really big role in is one of those that sort of started out conceptually as a research project and, you know, is now really standing on its own two feet. Uh, so that's a little bit of background about ML Perf. Um, you know, our benchmarks now dialing into sort of the, the focus for this talk really do span from microwatts to megawatts. So, you know, that gives us many, many, many orders of magnitude. Uh, you know, at the high end, we have training HPC where, you know, we've seen benchmarks run on something like a 10th of Fugaku, the world's largest supercomputer, all the way down to microwatt level, you know, IoT devices. And along the way, we've been adding benchmarks. We've been improving uh, how we handle things, especially on training for convergence and hyperparameter definitions to make the benchmarking easier, more reproducible and, and so forth. We've added power measurement to inference. And uh, we actually even have a mobile app that runs on iOS and Android, which is kind of cool, but you know, maybe not more super relevant for this crowd here. Um, <clears throat> So I'm gonna talk a bit about some of the challenges and decisions that were made in the ML Perf training benchmark. Uh, but before I start out, I wanna like acknowledge that when it comes to ML Perf training, I'm merely one of many. And in fact, uh, you know, I think the folks who played the most pivotal role are probably, you know, the sort of the top half, uh, the top three lines here, uh, you know, and so I'm, I'm getting to report on a lot of their good work. Um, so, when we look at how we define benchmarks, we start with a very data centric viewpoint, which is we want, we have a data set. You want a model that's going to accomplish some tasks, say image recognition, and then you want quality. And you want that quality to be pretty leading edge, right? If you're training to an uninteresting quality target, you know, you don't have an interesting benchmark. Um, and so one of the things to note here is you know, we haven't said what model. And so in the definition, one of the things that we originally looked at is we said, well, you know, if we really want apples to apples comparisons to be, you know, straightforward, right, we need to specify the model. So if something for like image recognition, we'd want to use ResNet. But the reality is that when you specify a model, you are implicitly picking some winners and losers, and you're also uh, precluding algorithmic innovations, right? You know, you might say, oh, you know, just to take ResNet for, ResNet for example, you know, there is an, there's the ResNext networks that are sparse uh, as opposed to dense layers, and that's going to favor a different type of architecture, right? So we have an open division where you can modify the model, bring your own model, do it almost whatever you want to really highlight more innovative approaches. And then we've got this closed division where you're going to use something that's mathematically equivalent to our model to ensure a high degree of comparability. And so this is a sort of key principle that is applied to almost all of our benchmarks, if not all. Um, so when you look at the training suite, this is sort of an inventory of the models, the data sets, and the quality targets that we have for the different training benchmarks. Now, this uh, does not include the three ML Perf HPC uh, benchmarks. You can read about those on our website, or um, you know, you can go talk to Steve. I'm sure he'd love to tell you about it and, and get you involved in helping to contribute to them and run them. Uh, but you can see here that we've got a pretty nice range. We've got recommendation, right? That's a very different workload than anything else 
up here. We, so uh, we've got a bunch of convolutional based neural networks for vision. We've got uh, a BERT based NLP model. We've got uh, a recursive neural network for speech. We've got some 3D segmentation and reinforcement learning. So there's a nice span here, um, you know, and so that's important, right? And, and the other thing is, again, our, our quality targets are pretty close to state of the art. Um, you know, there certainly are uh, uh, probably, in fact, I know for a fact you can find, say, image classification that'll hit over 75.9% top one, but not with ResNet 50, right? That's, you can, I think there was a very recent paper that showed through very careful pre-processing, you might be able to get better than this, but, you know, this is pretty close to state of the art. So it actually does represent something that is both reasonably fair, but also meaningful and generalizable, right? You know, if you're doing recommendation, you know, DLRM is a really nice representative of that. Um, and, you know, BERT certainly is a very good representation of what a lot of NLP is going to look like. Um, and the ones highlighted in blue are the ones that we added most recently for anyone who's curious about that. So we've talked about models and data sets, but one of the questions is, well, what's the metric you want to establish? And, and this is actually really important because I think one of the points of a benchmark is not just getting vendors to beat themselves up and improve, but it's actually promoting a shared understanding of what it means to be good, right? And so this metric is actually really important. Uh, you know, someone, you know, right, we were talking before the talk about uh, uh, Glenn Lockwood wrote a blog post saying that IOPS are an evil metric for storage because, you know, to summarize, they're, they're probably not terribly representative. They're overly simplistic, right? And so that's a great illustration of why it's important to pick the right metric. So the metric that we picked was time to train. And um, the only real other option that was suggested was sort of throughput, like, you know, samples per second process. Now, time to train has some some very significant advantages that I want to talk about. Uh, one of, and some disadvantages. So one is it's the most representative of what your customers care about, right? Like knowing the time to train that directly corresponds to what a user will experience. So that's good. Um, it also captures a lot of important algorithmic and numerical trade-offs, right? So if you look at a lot of training, there's actually a lot of training done in FP32 because it's the most accurate, right? And so there's a lot of people who are interested in doing training in reduced precision, and that's fine. But in some cases, it may increase the number of epochs that you need to converge. Uh, in an extreme case, you may not converge to the right accuracy, right? And so again, in keeping with let's align the benchmark to what creates value, that's a very important step because it forces people to make trade-offs against you know, actual accuracy and, and time to train, right? If you can train in int eight, that'll certainly boost your throughput, but if you can't get to the target accuracy, then you, know, you do not have a solution that is valuable. And I think that enforces these, these trade-offs as well as exposes things like increasing batch size you know, pretty typically increases the number of epochs, right? So we want to expose those trade-offs, uh, which we think are critically important. Um, now, the downside is it is computationally expensive. You know, a lot of our benchmarks take about a V100 week, uh, and some of the HPC benchmarks might be longer. Uh, it is computationally expensive, um, and it's high variance. Uh, unfortunately, convergence is an intrinsically stochastic thing, and we'll talk about that in a little bit later. But ultimately, we felt it was the best choice. Um, and this also requires that you use real data, I want to point out, and that's actually critically important because in a lot of cases, you know, using synthetic data will not get you meaningful results on ML. And so you have to be very, very careful about that, uh, right? You know, if the data distribution is not right. Um, you know, as a simple example, if you have some sort of uh, uh, like mask RCNN, which has, you know, a proposal based, uh, you know, you identify regions of interest and then you start doing uh, segmentation and object detection within there. If you use bogus data, you will not get the right numbers of regions of interest as you train. And so you kind of don't get a useful answer out of that. Um, so, you know, something to keep in mind. So, in defining this metric, we had to actually exclude some things from the time to train, and it's important to call those out. So we have system initialization, 
Uh, that depends a lot on how your cluster is implemented. And we don't really want people to go out and like optimize, you know, pretty significant clusters just for our benchmark, right? You know, if you look at some of the clusters that training is run on, you know, in the early days, it was 64 processors or accelerators. These days, it's 4,000. That's a really big cluster. And we don't want people kind of trying to, you know, really game the system in ways that don't add direct value. Um, so again, model initialization, uh, that becomes a disproportionately large part of the training time for a big system, unless you use a big data set, right? And in order to keep the runtime reasonable, we can't use giant data sets, right? You know, if you look at like some of the recommendation systems out there, you know, for example, I think Baidu, uh, you know, they've said that their embedding table alone is 10 terabytes. Um, and, you know, our recommendation model is a, an order of magnitude smaller in part because we want the time to train to be reasonable. And so, you know, because of that, we need to adjust out model initialization. And then also data reformatting. We don't want people to worry about like what data format things are in. So we let you sort of uh, pack and unpack uh, and rearrange uh, in a sort of principled way for free. Right, because you know, otherwise, then people start arguing about, well, what format did you put the 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 data in? Oh, you picked a format that doesn't advantage me. Like, we, we shouldn't be arguing about those things. Um, so I want to now dive into some of the challenges uh, that we have run into. So on the training side, right, the one issue is that there's no agreement on what you know software stacks and hardware systems look like. Right. If you look at the number of startups doing training, it's a lot. There's like over a dozen and with wildly varying architectures. Right. You know, you've got like Cerebrus systems with a wafer scale system with, you know, hundreds of thousands of very simple processing elements. You've got TPUs with very really large matrix multiplication arrays. You've got all sorts of other things in between. You could conceivably train on an FPGA, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and you also have different software stacks, right? Some companies have proprietary ones like Baidu uses Paddle Paddle. Um, you know, many cloud vendors have their own preferred stack. There's TensorFlow and PyTorch, which are, you know, the two heavyweights. And so what this means is, you know, you, from, an Apple, from a comparison standpoint, we can't even use the same code, let alone the same executable to get this apples to apples comparison. So this makes things pretty tricky. Um, Another issue, which I sort of alluded to before, is that we run at different scales, right? Uh, certainly training with a 4,000 accelerator system is pretty interesting for some of these cutting edge models. But, you know, there's also people who, you know, all they want is maybe two, four, or eight accelerators, or even maybe just a standard server running, uh, you know, in sort of a workstation-like configuration. And so that's valuable too. And those are like very different scales which means in many cases, you're gonna want different batch sizes or different optimizers. Uh, so, you know, you're gonna have fairly different tuning. And then as well, uh, hyperparameters need to be tuned as well, but hyperparameter tuning can be very expensive and is, it's not clear that that's actually super productive. Uh, you've also got different numerics as I alluded to before, right? You know, if you look at MLPerf submissions, I think you'll see everything ranging from FP32 to FP16 to Bfloat16 um, on the training side. And in inference, there's an even wider variety, right? So uh, we want to support that, you know, we're going to need a wide variety of, you know, potentially different hyperparameters, batch sizes, et cetera. So that makes things hard as well. And then the last thing that I mentioned before is convergence is stochastic, right? So uh, you know, typically when you train, you will initialize with random weights. That random weight initialization can have a pretty big impact. Uh, anecdotally, I can say, you know, I've seen cases where performance is varied by 20% uh, run to run due to weight initialization. So you can get lucky. Um, you can get really lucky. And, and, and that makes benchmarking hard. You know, in addition, you know, we're talking about floating point and, and floating point numerics are, you know, sort of inherently hard to reproduce. Um, especially once you start talking about some accelerators have stochastic floating points uh, where sort of the rounding may be performed somewhat stochastically. Um, so there's a lot of things that, that make ML training just really tough to tackle. And so, you know, next I'm going to talk about and illustrate some of these in more depth and then talk about the answers. So 
Here's an example of convergence variation on ResNet. And this actually looks pretty good. So what you can see is we've got five different runs and they all basically converge around 60 epochs more or less. So that's great. You know, the curves are a little unstable early on, but the convergence looks pretty good. So let's talk about something where convergence is bad. Uh, so Minigo, uh, this is our reinforcement learning uh, benchmark that's sort of a, a variant of AlphaGo, I believe. And what you can see is that it's not actually super clear. I mean, the average is probably around 40 epochs, but you're seeing things as low as 30, as high as probably 40, you know, somewhere between 35 and 45 is the range that it looks like. And, and it's not clear that there's really a rhyme or reason to that. So, you know, it's a benchmark specific thing, how the convergence works. And some benchmarks are just trickier than others. Um, you know, so that's an example of how convergence can be tough. Um, uh, Wahid, did you have a question? And, and by the way, I didn't <laughs> ask, but do we want to ask questions in line or at the end? I'm comfortable either way. Um, yeah, I think normally we, we allow some questions in line, but if it's getting crazy and you're not getting to stuff that you want to talk about, then mm -hmm. uh, just tell people to stop. Uh, okay. But I was just trying to understand this and whether it was like saying that a different experiment with the same seed was actually still. Right. right. So I think uh, each experiment here comprises five runs, each run with a different seed. I think I did not run these experiments. Okay. Um, yeah, that would whatever be. reason, our budget does not, you know, our paltry budget does not include uh, 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 large supercomputers. This was probably done by NVIDIA or, or uh, Intel or Google. Okay, great. If I had to guess, I would say NVIDIA. Yeah. Um, right. Yeah. Please go. On. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. So now let's talk about how we tackled some of these problems. So when it comes to the diverse software and hardware stacks, we sort of uh, pioneered this notion that is carried over to almost all of our benchmarks of a reference implementation that sort of defines what canonical correctness is, uh, and then rules for re-implementation. So we'll say, hey, this model in TensorFlow is what it means to be correct. You need to do something that's mathematically equivalent, but you can do it in any framework, in any language, in whatever you want, but you've got to follow the rules. And so the rules help to guard band things to ensure that they're roughly comparable despite having wildly different software stacks. Um, and so that's the approach that we took there. Uh, and I think, you know, if you look at training, you'll probably see that, you know, I can name off the top of my head, I think there's probably five different software stacks that have been used, TensorFlow and PyTorch, JAX, MXNet, uh, Sinian, which is from Alibaba, and then Paddle Paddle from Baidu. So I think that actually gets us up to six. So that's been like super successful. And it's nice because it does allow for comparisons in some cases between different uh, uh, frameworks. So uh, just as an example, you know, there was one submission that Google did where they had both JAX and TensorFlow at fairly large scale. And, you know, their, their point was really that despite the fact that JAX is a relatively new framework, uh, you know, it's getting performance that is very close to TensorFlow, but in a potentially much more programmer friendly way. So one of the nice things about having done this is it, it turns MLPerf into a very flexible tool, right? It's not just for hardware, it's not just for systems, but you can make software comparisons as well, potentially. Um, so in dealing with the different scale and numerics, uh, we decided to address this by having a limited set of tunable hyperparameters. Right. And so we sort of started with, OK, let's talk about changing batch size and numerics and then uh, downstream. Let's then make other hyperparameters tunable that you would want to change as you change those two things. So, you know, for example, you might change the learning rate as you change batch size. Right. And then actually we've sort of uh, in recent years or in the most recent uh, uh, round, maybe two rounds, we started something called reference convergence points where you know, for a given set of hyperparameters, we sort of have a suggested number of epochs something should take. Uh, and this helps to provide a lot of guidance to submitters and sort of longer term, we think it actually may allow us to simplify or shorten the submission process. But it's sort of, you, you, know, you can think of it as a lookup table where you index in 
uh, like batch size, uh, numerics, and then a set of hyperparameters, and then it coughs out a number of epochs that are expected. So this is actually some work that we're doing that's actually pretty novel and researchy, but could be a great contribution to the community overall. Um, and then with respect to uh, the stochastic convergence issue, which I illustrated previously, you know, we did sort of the most obvious thing, which is, you know, we're going to do multiple runs and average it. Uh, actually, what we do is Olympic scoring where, you know, you'll have five or 10 runs and drop the highest and lowest and average the rest. And generally speaking, the number of runs required is picked such that, you know, our actual reported score is expected to be plus or minus 5% of the true value, right? So we're aiming for a certain level of uncertainty. And uh, once we get within that, we're good to go. So that's how we've sort of handled those uh, uh, three particular bugbears. Um, now I want to talk a little bit about what the submission process looks like um, with some illustrations here. Um, so, and, and there's a little bit more details here as well. So we've got two divisions. I mentioned them before, the closed and the open. And here's a little bit more examples of how they vary. Uh, right in the closed division, you've got very limited hyperparameters. You don't get to change things like padding on images. Um, sorry, no, you do get to change padding and numerics, but you can't change the data sort order or number of layers, for example. Whereas in open, you don't need to be mathematically equivalent to the reference. So you can bring your own network, right? And you can say, hey, I don't like ResNet. I'm going to use ResNext or I'm going to use EfficientNet or you know whatever it is. As long as you hit the target accuracy, it's fun. Um, and I think even for some things, we may not even require that you hit target accuracy, but it must be reported. Um, and then in addition, and this may be a little bit more of, th there's some impacts on submission, but this is also somewhat of a marketing aspect. We have three different divisions. And so that's the commercially available, there's the available division where every component of the system is commercially available. Now, one of the implications of that is that that means that the submission itself should be pretty easy to reproduce, right? If you think about it, you know, if you submit on like, a, you know, a bunch of Azure hardware, you know, anyone else should be able to go and rent the stuff, run it and get this about the same scores, right? And if they can't, then there's a problem, right? Now, then we've got a preview division, which is for, for systems that contain one or more components that are not yet general availability, but will be within six months. And so we let you submit into preview, but then you must subsequently submit into available. And sort of the idea here is um, this benchmark happens every six months, uh, you know, basically every two quarters. We don't want to force engineering teams to alter their software release cycles to accommodate us. So we say, look, if your software isn't ready in time, you can do preview and then you just submit again. And, and you know, we can be sure that you weren't like doing anything funny with non-GA software that does weird things or weird non-GA hardware. Um, and then last, we have this RDI category for research prototypes, de you know, development systems and internal systems. So this would be, for example, for things that are just not publicly available. So we've actually seen a bunch of people submit FPGA prototypes uh, of systems, which is really cool. Um, you know, if you think about what that does for the community, you know, that actually gives folks the ability to start working on their software stack, you know, well in advance of getting hardware, which is really cool. So, um, you know, the way submission sort of works is you're gonna start by looking at the reference implementations, like take a look at the rules and join the submitter working group to figure out what you're really doing. Uh, if you don't join the submitter working group, you know, I, I have to confess our documentation is not the best in the world. And, you know, this is a complicated enough area that if you try to show up and submit without having asked any questions, like it'll be really impressive if you can make it. I mean, we have had some folks who did this who like literally showed up like right at the 11th hour um, and had only read the rules and had not really attended. And, you know, there were some problems in the rules. And so they ended up with an open submission instead of closed. That's, that's not an uncommon thing. So, um, you know, once you've sort of played around and gotten a lay of the land, you'll want to re-implement the benchmark for your system, you know, to tune for maximum performance. Um, you'll want to start tuning hyperparameters. You'll want to run the benchmark as many times as you need to, um, you know, no cherry picking, but, you know, you're going to have to do five or 10 runs. And then when you submit, what you submit 
is the logs from all of your runs, your code, your metadata, et cetera, into a private GitHub. And so the nice thing here is that actually what you're going to submit is a entirely reproducible artifact, right? Which then allows us to run a peer review process on it, right? And so post submission is this peer review process where you and your closest, nearest, and dearest competitors, rivals, or uh, I guess in the case of HPC, you know, peer labs, look at each other's submission and find the errors. And I, you know, we have not had a submission go by where there's not an error. Some of them are, are, are most of them are, you know, pretty innocuous and boneheaded things. Uh, but, you know, many eyes make light work. And this is one of the ways that with such a complex submission, we can keep the quality high. Um, now, the other thing that we do is we have this rule called hyperparameter borrow. So as I mentioned before, hyperparameter tuning can be really expensive and therefore it would advantage some companies uh, that have massive training resources over others, right? And so we have a rule that says you can submit with hyperparameters, but anyone else can take those hyperparameters and use them if they are awesome, right? And this has two things. One, it drives the industry forward by kind of figuring out what good hyperparameters are, but it also sort of levels the playing field between organizations that are willing to spend a lot of time on hyperparameter tuning and hopefully disincentivizes them to do that uh, and, and smaller organizations, right? How do we keep things fair for startups and big companies alike? Um, and while also enriching the field. So, you know, if you find a lucky set of hyperparameters, now everyone knows about it and the world is a better place. And then last, once the review is complete, we actually post all of those artifacts under an Apache 2 license. So customers and end users can go grab it and, and, and run it themselves and learn from it. So, you know, again, how do we drive the whole industry forward? And, and that's the point of the process. And then of course, we're gonna celebrate because uh, it's a non-trivial endeavor. And, and you know, uh, uh, we like to celebrate with cake when we can actually get together, but you know, not, it's been a while. Probably good for my belly, but. Uh, so I have a question here. Question? So, uh, so yeah. if you have your best parameters, why wouldn't you use them in the post submit? Uh, to give you an advantage, for instance. Ah, so you can't, um, you cannot hold back hyperparameters, right? So, yeah, but, but the, you can borrow hyperparameters from others. So, in second correct. round, it should be either your first or you yes, reference someone else. It cannot be any any modification. Yeah, it's not it's not arbitrary. It has to be a set of hyperparameters that were already submitted. So, what this means is, you know, you have to submit the hyperparameters, and you know it just limits the advantage of, you know, really going out and trying to find the best type of parameters. That, that's really the point there. Okay, so you need to review like in the post submit that the hyperparameters are, uh, should have um, appeared in the first submit. Yes, so during the post submission process, everyone can see everyone else's submission or, you know, all the people who submitted get to see all the submissions. So, you know, if you and I both submitted, I would get to look at your hyperparameters. And if I think they're better, I can go and borrow them, right? And if you think mine are better, you can borrow them, right? So that's the way it keeps the playing field level. Does that make sense? But you can't use like an arbitrary new set of hyperparameters. Okay. So are all submitters required to be part of the review process? Or is that something that's purely voluntary? Uh, you could not participate, but your, your, your submission must be reviewed. We don't publish results that have not been reviewed uh, because the likelihood of something going awry is too high. Um, right. But I mean, but it, someone will review it if I submit, even if I'm not a reviewer. I mean, there's I no guarantee, but it's all, it's very likely. I mean, you know, to be perfectly honest, there probably are some folks who submit and no one looks at their submission, but you know, if you look at training, you know, we've had between three and, you know, maybe a dozen submitters. And so between that, you know, there's a very good likelihood that anything interesting has been reviewed. Mm -hmm. You know, so I can't promise that every bug has been caught, uh, you know, and we explicitly sort of don't care about bugs that are under 2% cumulative performance, just because again, the level of uncertainty of the score is 5%. But, uh, uh, you know, it maximizes the likelihood that everything gets reviewed. So for the open division, is there someone who says, you know, ultimately that they're, that it qualifies, because there's so much wiggle room in there. Like, how, oh, I how, mean, how do you know it qualifies? Uh, I mean, it would be kind of hard to submit and not qualify. <laughs> okay. um, so, you know, 
but yeah, I mean, open to submissions are, are reviewed just like closed submissions. Okay. And, you know, we do require specifically for, for any available system, it must be something that can be reproduced, right? That's not optional for a commercial system. For preview and for RDI, it is. You know, as an example, I think Google submitted the TPU v4 in RDI well before it was publicly available to anyone else, right? And so there, in that case, you can't really reproduce it. Now, I think other submitters did reproduce sort of the number of epochs to train using their, that model to make sure that it passed the smell test. But obviously, no one else could get the actual execution time because no one else could get a TPU v4 at the time, right? But for, you know, something that's commercial, all commercially available components, it, you know, it should be uh, absolutely reproducible. So. Um, all right. And so this is what a submission round looks like, both before and after. And I believe these are the folks at Google, and you can see they're very hard at work. Uh, right down uh, to the last uh, hour. And you can see they're pretty relaxed afterwards with a party. So, um, yeah. So, uh, you know, I think we're about halfway through the talk. And um, uh, I want to talk about some of the things that we've learned along the way and some of the interesting data that we've got. So I think the first thing is, it's pretty great to see the impact of good benchmarking, uh, right? You know, we, we set out with a clearly defined set of problems, as I articulated before. And, you know, the net result is we're getting all sorts of folks from all across the industry to really compete on best performance, right? And we've got results that show what works best. Um, and the net result is, first of all, we are now getting a much better understanding of performance. You know, uh, one of the things I like to say is, you know, sort of before MLPerf came around, everyone would talk about flops as a good performance metric. And flops as a good performance metric is not good, right? It's just, you know, very misleading in, in a large number of ways, uh, right? So we've kind of established a common understanding of what performance really means that aligns with customer value. Number one, uh, we've got gotten a lot faster software stacks. I have some data on that in a bit, I believe. And we're now starting to see hardware that's being designed with MLPerf in mind. Um, and that's both a blessing and a curse, right? It's a blessing in that to the extent that MLPerf is representative and generalizable, then that's great, right? It helps point architects in the right direction. You know, uh, designing for the benchmark is always, you know, there's a little bit of mixed feelings on that and you want to make sure that there's not over-optimization there, uh, but it's also sometimes a little hard to pre prevent, frankly. Um, and so, you know, we're seeing uh, a lot of benefits from MLPerf, and we'll dive into that in a little bit. So this is a slide that I pulled together from the uh, first, the f four only rounds of training so far. And you can see the performance of Moore's law, you know, sort of how many more transistors would we naively expect to get with this green line on the bottom, right? And so, you know, it's about two and a half times more transistors over this period in time. And when you look at the actual performance that we're seeing, it's more like, you know, 16 or 30X more performance, right? So MLPerf is helping the industry drive performance very fast, like 30X over, even 16X over two years or two and a half years is a pretty good pace, right? That's, that's fantastic. Um, and so the benchmarks here are, are the three ones that have been in all the benchmark suites. Uh, ResNet 50 is image classification, SSD ResNet 34 is an object detector. And there's an asterisk by both of those. And what that means is that we actually improved the accuracy target and made it harder between version 0.5, this first dot, and version 0.6, the second dot. So if anything, this actually understates the performance gain. Uh, and then mask RCNN is an image segmentation, uh, you know, slash heavyweight detector. Uh, and and, and uh, that's actually quite challenging. So, um, you know, this is a great example of how ML Commons is helping to make ML better for everyone. So how did we get there? So one of the nice things is I can dive in and tease out some of these numbers uh, to, to help understand how we got better performance. So 
Uh, you know, in this slide on the y-axis is relative performance for five of the MLPerf benchmarks in across three rounds, looking at the same system, but with improved software stacks. And so what you can see is that, and again, we improved accuracy targets on, on some of these, um, but that we were able to boost performance through purely software alone by somewhere in the neighborhood of, you know, nothing at all in the case of NMT, although the, the accuracy went up, but, you know, 2x for, over 2x for Mask RCNN, about 2x for ResNet, um, you know, for Transformer, about 1.75x. Those are pretty significant improvements due to software alone. And again, same system size. So, you know, this is a great example of how MLPerf can help to drive value for everyone, right? These are free and performance improvements for everyone in the community, at least everyone who updates their software. Um, and the other thing I'd point out is this, this is a comparison against the fairly highly optimized baseline, right? This is not like, you know, comparing GCC 02 versus GCC, o, or sorry, GCC 0 versus 02. Right, this is someone tuned for the benchmark as best they could the first time around and every subsequent time. So this is a, actually a really nice comparison. Um, so one of the other ways that we're seeing a lot of performance is system scale. And as HPC folks, I'm sure this will resonate since uh, you, know, you look at some of the uh, large scale exascale supercomputers that we've got and they're at, at a very large scale. So um, this is a comparison of the number of processors, whether CPUs or accelerators, in the largest submission for MLPerf version 0 0.5, 0 0.6, and 0 0.7 over five different benchmarks that were in those suites. And so what you can see is first of all, there's a, a bunch of interesting things. First, each benchmark scales differently, right? You look at Mask RCNN and it, and it is capped out at about 512 processors in this comparison, while quite a few of the other ones are at 4,000. Right, each network is different, has its own challenges. Uh, and so that's great. It's an argument for diversity in the benchmark suite. But what you also see is that the amount of parallelism has gone up by, you know, in some cases, 64x over time. Now, performance does not increase quite the same with parallelism, since typically you will need to increase the number of epochs. So you're doing more work to get that parallelism but you're driving much higher performance and better overall time to solution. And you know this is gonna capture both improvements in software, improvements in algorithms, and potentially improvements in sort of uh, model representation, right? You know, if you start to use model parallelism, you may be able to scale better. So you know, we're, we're seeing a lot of different things all captured together and rolled up in this chart. So, uh, You know, if you, okay, this is slightly redundant with my prior one, but this is again, if we want to look at all of these factors together over the first three rounds of MLPerf, right, what you see is, you know, performance gains on the order of 10 to 25x, you know, again, across three rounds. So that's pretty cool, uh, right? And so to be clear, this comparison would not just be algorithm software scale, but also potentially new accelerators, things like that. So rolling in all the factors together. So I wanted to share a selection of thoughts here. Um, so first, you know, when you look at time to train, smaller is going to be better. Um, and as you look at the results, there's a lot that you can learn by digging into them and doing, you know, clever comparisons, right? MLPerf is a full system benchmark. It encompasses, as I said, your model, your hyperparameters, the training algorithm, you know, your optimizer, et cetera. It includes software, things like your numerics, your compilers, your math libraries. It includes the hardware, of course, uh, and not just, you know, what is your accelerator or processor, but what's the networking that's available? How are the servers configured? Um, and so there's a lot you can learn by digging into these submissions. Um, scale really matters. So you know, training on eight processors is just fundamentally different from training on 4,000, right? You know, you're going to stress your interconnect a lot more. You're going to need model partitioning at large scale. Um, your efficiency will drop at large scale. And so, you know, you can't, you know, that makes some of the comparisons really tricky over different system scales, right? You're going to need, 
you know, as you go to larger batch size, which is commonly done for more nodes, you're going to need more compute to converge, right? Um, and there's some sort of rules of thumb I've seen where I want to say something like, you know, increasing, I'm going to get it wrong if I try to, I believe there is an empirical relationship between the increase in batch size and the number of epochs needed to compute, right? And it's, it's slower than linear, right? Otherwise no one would do it, but there is a relationship there. So, um, and then, you know, one of the key takeaways is, you know, if you wanna look at performance per chip, right? Which people often do, you know, don't try to compare performance per chip for 4,000 processors in eight, cause you're just in, you know, radically different corners of the design space. Um, when you look at the results, I mean, you really have to go in with an open mind, right? You know, every submission is going to say something, but you have to sort of dig in and figure out what that really is. So, you know, try to look at submissions that are different on some dimension and similar on others, right? So you could look at, you know, how does a given accelerator scale or processor scale and system size? Uh, you could look at uh, how does the software evolve over time? Uh, how does a new software stack do? I mentioned the, the, the comparison that Google did between JAX and TensorFlow. That's a good example. You can look at how systems improve as they go from preview to available or from RDI to preview to available and, and sort of see the impact of tuning, right? You know, how much better can you get as the vendors tune their software stack? Um, and of course, you can always look at new processors as well. So there's a lot of exciting things that you can find in the results. Um, so how are we doing on time? I think we've got 10 minutes left. So maybe we should skip talking about inference and, and just, uh, you know, turn it over to Q and A. Do folks have questions or did I just blow everyone's mind? So if you'd like to ask a question, feel free to unmute yourself or, uh, raise your hand and I can call on you as well. I know I have a ton of questions, but I want to make sure the audience gets out there. <laughs> I, for one, would like to hear about inference. Okay. Can, yeah, can you give you, yeah. A All right, let's do a real quick version of this. Uh, same definition, you have to use our model for closed and you can use any model for open. Uh, these are the benchmarks in inference, go look at them later. Uh, we also have mobile inference, which is targeted at smartphones. Um, one of the big differences with inference is we have a lot of different scenarios where there are different metrics. So we've got sort of a latency optimized single stream case where the metric is actually what is your query latency, 90th percentile. You've got multi-stream, which is sort of focused on if you have like many cameras driving at once, how many streams can you handle? Uh, we've got server, which is sort of mimics, you know, any sort of server type scenario and the throughput in it, and the metric is sort of queries per second. So it's throughput, but with a latency bound. So, you know, you, it might be queries per second subject to a latency bound of 99% of queries must be handled within 15 milliseconds, something like that. And then we have an offline scenario where it's just pure throughput, no, no latency constraints at all. Um, submitters on the inference side, again, have to use common weights but they can re-implement uh, uh, and they have to use our load generator, but they are allowed to re-implement their inference engines, use whatever they want, et cetera. And the load generator uh, generates queries, times them, and then validates the, the accuracy of the network to make sure it's sufficient. Um, in order to avoid a quantization contest, we allow quantization, but it must be described uh sort of in a you know imagine like a short pa page long paper type thing uh and you're allowed to use a very small calibration data set you know maybe a hundred or a thousand images for example but you can't actually retrain and part of the reason we don't want to allow retraining is that it would provide an advantage to folks who are good at training you know not necessarily good at inference right so we do allow quantization again, using the calibration data sets, but no retraining in the closed division, that's for open division only. So that's a brief whirlwind tour through inference. And now I think we've got five minutes for Q and A. Right. Um, oh, and I should mention that the ML perf 
Training rules have been modified by the HPC working group. And I think the biggest modification is that the data has to start in like uh, persistent shared storage for the cluster rather than in any like local node cache. Uh, is that right, Steve? Uh, yeah, yeah, basically. Yeah, so. All right, now let's get to those questions. Okay, Wahid. Yeah, I have a question I, I could ask earlier. Um, so great, great presentation and, and um, yeah, MLPerf is, is fantastic. Um, and I think in, in multiple aspects, I mean, in the way that you can, um, you know, see all these surprising, you know, new software that pops up that does amazingly well, like Jax and, um, and uh, the way that you can look at people's submissions and see the actual code that was implemented and use it yourself and all these aspects. Um, so yeah, I think it's great. Uh, I just wanted to ask a couple of questions while in this session about the, um, you, you know, you talked about software improvements mm -hmm. and I was just wondering, so that was across all software, right? Not, it's not for a particular framework. You weren't comparing one, the submissions from one framework to an, in that plot, right? Uh, it was in, like, they might've used a different framework or- In this, in this? Yeah. Uh, they probably were all on this. So I suspect that, for example, the ResNet 50 was done using the same framework, but it, not necessarily. Right. Um, yeah, because I think there, it's also been surprising how, uh, well, I mean, for me, I, I, like there isn't a, a TensorFlow isn't really on ResNet competitive, like MXNet and I think is the leading example. I mean, it's, it's often interesting how yes. different, um, models or there are different problems have different frameworks that ended up being the best one for that. that that's correct. <laughs> yeah, that is, that is absolutely correct. Right. And I, I think the results do show that, you know, some folks prefer MXNet from a performance standpoint. Right. Um, and, and, you know, that's why we want to have re-implementation. Now, you know, the, the flip side is, you know, in, in my understanding is that MXNet is, you know, vastly less popular than TensorFlow and, and, and PyTorch. Right. So, you know, can you get that performance, you know, if you're willing to use MXNet, right? But, you know, we can also see what the, you know, delta in performance might be, um, you know, and that's certainly an experiment you could run on your own as well, potentially. Right. I guess I, I'm saying, I, I find it a, a bit surprising that after these things were run, that uh, they didn't kind of converge a bit, like the frameworks kind of maybe saw, oh, well, it's potentially possible to get this kind of performance out of it. So why aren't we getting it? And yeah, so... I mean, I can't tell you for sure why that is, but I can share some sort of like anecdotal thoughts, which is I think, you know, frankly, some of the frameworks out there may not actually value that last 20% of performance very much, right? And it might be more important to have good usability uh, than, than good performance. Yeah, that makes sense. Right. I mean, that's the argument for caches over Scratchpad, right? Everyone knows that Scratchpad memories are vastly more power efficient, vastly more performant. But, you know, the reality is that caches are a bajillion times easier to use for programmers, you know, in, until you shoot yourself in the head with some like, you know, pathologically bad eviction case. But, you know, um, right. Usability is absolutely a value proposition, is I guess what I would say. Mm -hmm. So I have a question, you know, so for, for HPC, we have the top 500 and I see yes. Eric is on the call too, um, that, uh, you know, we want to say like you're number one, but I, yeah. I noticed in MLPerf, there is not a year number one, even though time to solution is the metric, there's no one saying like, you know, like crowning anyone because there's so many, I don't know, variations. Ah. To being number so, one. so I will, I will point out, there's a distinction between what ML Commons will say and what the submitters will say. <laughs> there are definitely some submitters okay. that'll be very clear about who is number one and oh. they will slice and dice it in, in peculiar ways and in, in the, in the, in, as any good marketing org, if you, if you slice things fine enough, you can always be the best. You know, I'm thrilled to be the best David Cantor that lives in San Francisco. I think that is true. Um, sadly, I seem to have a rival who lives in New York and is a movie producer <laughs> or maybe he's in LA. I don't know, but, uh, you know, uh, you know, I think 
one of the things that, you know, so frankly, like, first of all, I love the clarity that top 500 brings, and I really wish we could get that. Um, you know, I've talked with Jack about that. Uh, and, you know, because I think one of the things that's like critical that ML Perf does is, you know, real data, real workloads, um, you know, things that are performance relative, sorry, relevant. Uh, and I'd love to see it being widely used. I'd love to see ML Perf HPC be widely used, um, you know, for all supercomputers. Uh, and, you know, top 500 is phenomenally popular. And, you know, it's at a different point in the design space. Um, and, you know, I think it was designed to scale nicely, uh, right? Whereas, you know, ML Perf is designed to make scaling hard and force people to do hard work. Um, you know, and, and I think those reflect different things. And one of the things I very much admire about top 500 is that single number is super easy to grasp, right? And so I, you know, part of the motivation may be that, you know, in the HPC community, you, you know, in, in the United States, you're subject to the wings of Congress to get money. And I don't think that ML perf is necessarily fully comprehensible to a Congress person. Uh, whereas, you know, uh, uh, for starters, bigger is better is always more comprehensible to anyone. Uh, but then, yeah, you know, should, you know, we, we initially did discuss, do we want like a geometric weighted mean? And, but the reality is that not everyone cares about all of the same things, right? If you look, you know, I think Facebook and some of their public presentations has basically said that for them, the single most important thing is recommendation followed by like language models. And then like vision is, you know, a minor amount of their fleet, right? And so the thing is that, you know, the, the, the relative weighting of the benchmarks for them is going to be totally different than someone like, say, Tesla, where they've been public, you know, pretty public that, you know, they only care about vision, right? You know, they don't really care about uh, recurrent neural networks for speech or recommenders. Um, and so, you know, I think that was sort of a point that we, we kind of got to to keep everyone happy and, you um, yeah, I don't know. If you have any great solutions on how to get, you know, one number that's easy to understand and, you know, still, you know, really meaningful and doesn't get all of the vendors wanting to strangle you, please, please see me afterwards and you'll become my best friend. Okay. <laughs> I'll think about it. All right, well, so we hit the top of the hour and, uh, you know, I, we, we want to thank uh, David for a great seminar. If anyone has any additional questions, feel free to um, write them in the chat or... Uh, but I, I want to release anyone who who needs to leave. We're going to stop recording and um, yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and and by the way, please feel free to reach out and, and talk to me about these things. We're always looking to engage more folks in the community, um, you know, and and input and collaboration. You know, I'd love uh, to to actually, you know, one one thing. It, it might be nice to actually get some collaboration between the ML Perf HPC and the top five hundred folks. You know, things like that. Um, you know, we're, we're very friendly and fun to work with. And uh, I don't know, one of the guys who was working, who, who, our systems administrator actually commented that he was really shocked at the lack of ego in uh, ML Commons, which I took as uh, quite a compliment. So. Um, Great. All right. Thanks everyone for attending. Yeah. Thank you so much. And yeah, happy to stick around and chat more. Yeah. So, so there are going to be some people who are sticking around. And, yeah. I will. And, and I won't be offended if I smell funny and you want to leave. <laughs> All right. I'm going to stop recording.